This is a five second tutorial on how to make a terrible solder joint. Pull the big ball of solder and apply it to cold wires. Ta-da! This is junk. Instead, this is what a good solder joint looks like. But why am I out here filming in the snow? That's to show you that with the right technique, you can solder anywhere at all, even in the middle of a Canadian winter. That being said, I kind of want to continue the video back inside. Ah, oh, this is a little bit better. A lot warmer in here. Now that I'm not uh, freezing my fingers off, I want to provide you with a comprehensive guide on everything that goes into soldering a pair of wires together. Looking at the tools required, the maintenance of those tools, and some of the safety aspects. And then at the very end of the video, we'll even finish our solder joints off with a little bit of fire. In this video, I'll be using the Hakko FX888 soldering iron, which is an absolutely beautiful machine, but a little pricey. Starting out, I'd recommend a more affordable soldering iron. Look for one with temperature adjustment and a sturdy stand. Some of these smaller stands are just waiting for a light breeze to knock them over and start a fire. By unscrewing the end of the soldering iron, we can actually remove the tip and swap it out for different shapes. But the standard tip will work for 95% of your basic wire splicing needs. I've put together an Amazon shopping list with some great beginner tools. Click the link down in the description if you want to check it out. In terms of solder, there's two different types, lead-based and lead-free solder. Lead-based solder melts at a lower temperature and flows very smoothly, making it a lot easier to use. But do remember that lead is toxic, so make sure you wash your hands after you finish soldering and don't go eating or drinking anything at the same time while you work. For these safety reasons, I actually prefer using lead-free solder and it's what I'll be using for the rest of the video today. There are some downsides to lead-free solder in that it does require a higher temperature to melt and just doesn't really flow as easily as lead-based solder does. I find that 0.8mm solder is the most versatile and my usual go-to, but again, check the description for specific product recommendations. Interestingly, solder is actually a hollow metal tube with a substance inside it called flux or rosin core. Flux improves the solder flow and adhesion by reducing oxidation. Alright, safety. So we talked about not ingesting lead-based solder, but we also want to work in a well-ventilated space and potentially use an exhaust fan with an air filter in it. While it sounds obvious, when turned on, the entire rod of the soldering iron will get extremely hot. Don't touch it, and try not to electrocute yourself by getting distracted and melting through the cable, kind of like what's happened in this, this one here. Right, that's enough of me yapping on. Let's turn on the soldering iron, crank it up to 650 degrees Fahrenheit, and then once it's up to temperature, we'll be able to start by cleaning the tip. Without regular cleaning, excess solder builds up, the tip oxidizes and corrodes. This particular tip has seen an impressive amount of neglect, so it's gonna be extremely ineffectual at transferring heat. To prevent this, I clean the tip every couple of minutes by tinning both sides with fresh solder and then lightly brushing off the excess in a brass sponge. After cleaning, the tip should come out smooth and shiny. An alternative to brass is using a damp sponge, but I don't personally like it as it's a hassle to get wet, it drops the surface temperature of the tip, and if the sponge is too dry, it'll actually melt onto the tool, making an even bigger mess to clean up. Whatever you do, please promise me that you won't use steel wool or a file in an attempt to clean off the end of a soldering iron. There are some videos on YouTube recommending this method, but they're just far too aggressive and abrasive. What you're doing is you're actually stripping away the protective coating that the manufacturer puts on there at the factory, and after that's gone, it's going to lead to even faster deterioration and oxidation. I'll now strip an inch of material off a pair of wires using this automatic wire stripper. If you're curious about this tool, check out this dedicated video. As you can see, the wire is made up of lots of individual strands, so the first thing I want to do is twist them all into one single core. To solder them together, we could theoretically lay them parallel to each other, but that's going to leave a small air gap between them, and we'll be relying entirely on the solder to hold them together. 
While easy and commonly found in examples online, this particular method of twisting is inferior as there's a single break point at the base. Instead, we want to twist them around each other. The most commonly used method to achieve this is to create an X shape in the middle of the wires, then using my two index fingers, I can twist the strands around one another. This works, but I personally find it a little tricky to twist two loose ends of wire around each other at the same time. My preferred method is to pinch one end of the wire at the base of the insulation of the other wire to create this V shape. Then using my free hand, I can twist the loose end around. Ultimately, the method you use is just personal preference, so I encourage you to try them both and find out what works better for you. Three things to check for are the wires twisted end to end. You don't want any untwisted sections or unequal cable lengths. Are they laying flat? We don't want any strands sticking out that could later puncture through the insulation. And is it a snug fit? I should be able to apply a little bit of tension without it coming apart. To solder, I'll hold these wires in a pair of helping hands. Out in the snow, I demonstrated what bad soldering technique looks like by applying solder to the tip of the iron and then trying to paint it onto cold wires. But what exactly was wrong with this and what are the steps we can take to ensure proper soldering technique? The first issue is that when we apply solder to the tip of the iron, all this smoke is actually the flux burning off. And recall the entire reason that we use flux is to help the solder flow and reduce solder oxidation. It's not very useful if it all evaporates before we even get to our work surface. And the second issue is that while I was trying to deposit the solder, it solidified immediately because the wires were way too cold. This is known as a cold solder joint. Instead, good soldering technique is all about maximizing heat transfer to the work surface and then bringing in fresh solder full of flux that will easily flow through to the target. To achieve this, I'm going to give you a checklist of four items that will ensure you get consistently good results. First, use the flat edge of the iron for a larger surface area contact and better heat transfer, not just the narrow end of the tip. This can be achieved by holding the iron at a shallow angle but not so much that I accidentally melt the insulation. Second, keep the iron stationary and apply gentle and firm pressure for effective heat transfer. Don't try sweeping with the iron because the tip will lose contact as it skips over the wire's surface. You're also trying to just heat up too large of an area all at once. The third step and truly the secret to efficient soldering is to apply a little bit of solder to the tip of the iron. This isn't for direct application to the wires, but to improve heat transfer. The liquid solder's surface tension increases the contact area with the wires, therefore enhancing heat transfer. Before the fourth and final step, if this tutorial is helping you and you have the means, please consider supporting the creation of more educational content like this through my page on buymeacoffee.com forward slash Will Donaldson. Link in the description. Putting those three steps together, we are guaranteed to get a nice hot surface. I have a ball of solder on the iron, I come in with the edge of the tool, not the tip, and I hold it stationary in the middle for a couple of seconds. Now that the wires are hot, I'll bring in fresh solder. See how it melts instantly on hot wires? And most importantly, notice that I'm heating up the wire from one side and adding solder from the other side. This is the fourth important step to effective soldering as it gives the solder a chance to wick in between the strands of wire. If I try adding solder next to or directly onto the tip of the iron, then as you can see, it has the tendency to pull on the tip instead of flowing into the wires. Start feeding the solder from the center outward, covering the wires completely. Then glide the iron over the connection to smooth over any irregularities. When I'm happy with the connection, I can remove the solder first and then the iron. If you do it in the reverse, you may find that the solder rapidly cools and solidifies on the wire. But if that does happen, simply reheat, melt and remove. Here's the complete list of four steps if you want to take a screenshot. Once soldered, I also have four steps of visually confirming that a joint is good. Firstly, I want to see that the solder is wrapped all the way around and in between individual wire strands. 
Secondly, the solder should be applied up to the edge of the insulation without melting it. If a section is left exposed, it'll be extremely flexible and easy to break. Thirdly, is there too much solder? If so, I can remelt it and with a sweeping hook motion, pick up the excess solder with my iron. I can then brush this off in my sponge. And fourth, are there any spikes? If so, we want to smooth them over. Ideally, we'd do this before soldering by ensuring our twists lay flat, but we can still smooth over spikes with patience and a little bit of pressure. Once you're happy with the joint, we'll want to protect it from the environment and any unintended short circuits with a piece of heat shrink tubing. I personally find hot air guns to be a little cumbersome, so instead my go-to is a lighter. Holding the heat shrink in the blue part of the flame will ensure a clean finish. If you hold it in the orange part of the flame, a layer of soot will be deposited that doesn't look the prettiest. Sometimes you can't slide on the insulation after soldering. Instead, preload the heat shrink and then solder. But be careful. Leave it too close while soldering and the tube may shrink prematurely. But whatever you do, please promise me you won't use electrical tape. It'll start peeling off within months, if not weeks. If you have absolutely no other option than electrical tape, at least secure it with two small zip ties on either end. Don't forget to clean the tip one last time before turning it off, and I'll see you in the next one.